This morning we come again to the book of Titus, and uh, I'm reminded of this, that in our culture today, we have a lot of things around you, and this is one of those few times when I'm going to ask you to, uh, to just kind of really pay attention to the title this morning. Uh, this um, is, a, is an important thesis really for the whole message, but think with me for just a moment. Think with me for just a moment. We live in a day and time when there's a lot of things that we wish were really good and we hope that they're really good, but they're not very good. Um, we kind of look around. In fact, we, we don't, we're not quite sure what to think of a lot of things that are before us. There's a lot of things that are kind of, in fact, fake. They, they look good, but in fact, they don't deliver. And part of that's the media age that we live in. You can make anything look good. You can make a house look like the Taj Mahal and uh, you get there finally to the house that you're thinking about renting or buying, and it, it's a mess. Or you can make a meal look fantastic, and then you go there, and it's really not that good. Um, we, we live in a culture, and we live in a world where looks can be deceiving. In fact, we can be drawn to things that we think are good for us when, in fact, they're not. And we can wind up with some real issues there. Well, there's another aspect of our culture that's very powerful upon us. We, we seek to negotiate everything. We seek to kind of make everything our plan or our, um, we, we put our spin on it. We seek to have our um, fingerprints on the deal that is there. In fact, we have people all over Washington that are always talking about deal making, that there's different deals made between different parties and different nations. We, we talk a lot about all of the negotiations that are, and boy, in the political process right now, I know that we hear it really ad nauseum, all of the issue of the, the negotiations that are all around us. And our own individualization ability uh, within our culture, you have a phone and you can choose it to, you, you, it can look kind of however you want it to look, you can change the background, you can change the colors you, on your desktop of your computer, you can change all of that, and you can even put forth whatever you want everyone to see. You're, you're able to really adapt the message and make it just kind of yours. Um, even in our own court system very often in this day and time. Everything is up for negotiation concerning crimes. Everything is up for negotiation about who really is at fault, what really is the consequence that is there, and you, in fact, hire someone to come and make your case for you. Now, I'm thankful for various aspects of the law that hopefully are moving toward justice in each one of our cases. I mean, we have people in our church that have been wrongly accused before, very clearly wrongly accused, and we're thankful that our justice system here allows for that, but quite honestly, even with issues of the law, we seek to negotiate them. When we come to God's plan, two things are important for us to understand very clearly. The first one is that God's plan is good. God's plan doesn't just look good, it doesn't just sound good, or sometimes it may look bad. And everything around us is saying it's bad when, in fact, it's good. The passage that we're going to look at is going to show us that, that this is good. God's plan is good. And not only is God's plan good, but God's plan is non-negotiable. Now, I know that that's a disappointment to some of you when you think I could have written the art of the deal too and you could have, you know, made up your own deal. And the world thinks along those lines. But we need to recognize and we can recognize from this little verse in chapter 3, verse 8 that God's plan is not negotiable. He is not a God that negotiates with us about our sin. He is a God that comes and he deals with our sin one way or the other. And the cross of Christ has one cross on its right and one cross on its left. And those are the two ways in which God deals with our sin. Either going into condemnation, enduring the result of our sin upon ourselves, or coming to the cross of Christ in belief 
and f- discovering his great grace for life. So God's plan is not negotiable. It is very, very clear. I want us to re- look at this. Now, some of you are new to us this morning. We, w- we don't want you to be lost for the next 20 minutes. Um, somebody said 20 minutes. Yeah, I, so whatever it's going to be. We don't want you to be lost for the next few minutes. So on your pew Bible, take that red Bible out in front of you if you don't have a Bible with you, and look with me in page 1,272 to, act, or to Titus chapter 3. Um, For those of you who are new to us, notice the context in review, and everyone will look at this. The Apostle Paul uh, has left missionary Titus, a guy named Titus, on the island of Crete in the Mediterranean to straighten out wayward churches. There was a bunch of churches that were messed up churches. And those churches had problematic leaders, problematic doctrine, and problematic behavior. Fill that last one in, behavior. The people weren't acting like Christians in those churches. And this is a problem for our day and time. In our current culture, there are many people who are in churches, but they have problematic leaders who are either scamming the crowd or preaching false doctrine or in it for themselves, or their doctrine is all messed up, and usually because of those leaders, And when in those two cases are often the case, it certainly points to Christians not acting like Christians. So notice here with me and fill this in, the life of the church members is to be distinctly Christian. And that's what Titus is about. It's saying that Christians should actually look and sound and smell like Christians. They shouldn't just blend in the world, with the world and look like the world. Not that we're called to be odd for God, but we are called to be distinctly his in a world that has rejected him. So um, look at the next part. You see, when we are distinctly Christian, this is a powerful witness for showing Christ to a godless culture, like the culture of Crete, or perhaps the culture of South Florida, or wherever it is that Christians find themselves living. When we live distinct Christian lives, it shows the people that are around us what Christ looks like. Now, I, last week's message was God our Savior. And notice what, what we said. In, f- in fact, say that title out loud with me if you would. God our Savior, not in me, all in him. And we find that in verses four through seven. So look in the box on your page that is there. Verses four through seven is what we looked at last week. And it says, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior, underline that, God our Savior appeared, he what? Verse five, he saved us. Circle the word not. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. In case if you haven't noticed it, verse four, five, and six cover the Trinity. It's God the Father, our Savior through Christ. He does this. The power of the Holy Spirit working and moving. How does the power of the Holy Spirit bring about our salvation? We see this here through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Look at verse 7. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs, that's inheritors, heirs according to the hope of what? Eternal life. You see, the gospel is good news. We see that God's plan is for us to be brought into a relationship with him for eternity where we are not cut off from him, we are not condemned from him, but that he gives to us eternal life, and he does it all through his work and not ours. So notice these bullet points that are there, um, that are here um, underneath that statement. God is our Savior. Second bullet point. We are not our Savior. Now, this is the biggest lie in the universe, that you can save yourself, that your good works will outweigh your bad works, and God will, quote, unquote, let you in, that somehow there's an intrinsic value in you which you can save, um, maybe not even yourself, but perhaps even your family, 
But we come to see that God is the Savior. We are not the Savior. Look at that next to that statement. It says, not because of works done by us in righteousness. The third bullet point is, our salvation is the Holy Spirit's work of washing and renewal. So the Holy Spirit comes and washes away our sin and causes us to be made new. You need to be made new. You don't need to fix up what you got. You need to get a whole new deal. And the whole new deal comes from God coming and renewing us. And this is the picture of what he does. Third, fourth bullet point. It is made possible through Jesus's, you remember what we said last week? Big word, substitutionary sacrifice. That's an important word for Christians to know. We just have sung about it in two songs. We just sang about it in the most recent song when we said, he died in my place that he took my place on the cross. This is the substitutionary sacrifice or the substitutionary atonement for our sins. Jesus dying, the one who shouldn't have died. Second person of the Trinity, perfect in his holiness, and yet he comes and he lays down his life for his friends. Look at the last bullet point there. Jesus' sacrifice makes us right with God. It is Jesus' sacrifice that makes us right with God. Not our good works. Not our grandfather who was a Baptist preacher. Not our mother who was a wonderful saintly mother that, to us that we just think was so wonderful. That will not save you. It is only the sacrifice of Christ that makes us right with God. And that's the word justified that is there. He justifies us before God. And this gives us, fill it in, eternal life. You see, the gospel is good news. It's good news that involves life. I want to take just a couple of moments and look at the very next verse that is here in verse 8. So richly powerful where we see that God's plan is good and that it's non-negotiable. We see that it is this beautiful picture. Look with me in verse 8. It has an interesting statement at the beginning of verse 8. Look at the beginning of verse 8. The saying is trustworthy. And I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to what? To good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. Look at the beginning of verse 8. The saying is trustworthy. Now what's kind of interesting is there's a little bit of debate about what saying is the Apostle Paul talking about here, except that those who've really studied a little bit more and looked at verses 4, 5, 6, and 7, the ones that we just noticed, they have showed up in other places where they were likely a song, or they were likely a hymn, or a recitation that the early church would have known. And so what he's saying is, look, our salvation comes through God and his sacrifice for us, through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, not us. We are called to good works. That's what Titus is saying. Christians are supposed to act like Christians. We're not saying that Christians aren't supposed to do something. Christians are supposed to do something. In fact, they're supposed to do a lot. But don't confuse yourself and think that by doing that you are saving yourself. That's the great point of Titus chapter 2, that key passage that Tommy Morgado preached a few weeks ago, and then what we looked at even last Sunday, the lyrics of this hymn that are driving home, you can't save yourself, don't think that you can save yourself, you should do these things that God has called us to do, you should live, live a distinct Christian life, but don't think that you're saving yourself. What he's saying is, the lyrics that we cite in church or that we sing is a trustworthy saying. But even though that's a trustworthy saying, we are still called to do and to obey our Lord. You see, it is the basis, and fill this in, it's the basis for everything in the Christian's life. The gospel of God's grace through Jesus Christ, this is the foundation for everything in a Christian's life. If there's any hope, if there's any hope to do the right thing, if there's any hope to live a distinct Christian life, if there's any hope to make it through the troubles and the trials that Pastor Ben was just praying about, if there's any hope for all of these things, it is found in the sacrifice and the redemption of Christ in us. Even our faith comes through this. 
Now look at the next phrase of verse verse 8. Paul is the one writing the letter, and he's writing it to who? Oh, you guys, don't make me run away. What does it say at the top of the page? Oh, Paul is writing to who? Okay, thank you. He is writing to Titus, and he is saying to Titus, I want you to insist on these things. You see, this is strong language. A lot of folks would say, you mean churches can insist on something? I thought that this is all big voluntary sport here. I mean, what, 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 are we, what do you mean insisting? You mean, well, we, we see again here the urgency, fill this in, we see the urgency and the authority of God's plan for the church and our lives. That this, is, this is dealing with God. This isn't just human institutions. And so it's not just preferences. It it is God working out his truth in the lives of people. And that's what we see Paul instructing. Now, in chapter 1 and verse 5, and I've outlined this a little bit, we we see that in chapter 1, verse 5, and if your Bible is open, you can flip over there to that and see it, but it says that Paul is to put what remained, those things that were out of order, into order. So the word put what remained in order, the word put there is to make it happen. It's kind of like Jean-Luc Picard in Star Trek, make it so, when he does that. And, you know, the spaceship takes off and they go. I know some of you who are not Trekkies, you don't follow that. But those of us who are, you kind of go, yeah, you know, that does, this is his command. This is what he does. And it's not up for negotiation. When he says, make it so, this is the, the authority of it happening. And so we see, he says, put what remained in order, make it so, fix those things, and appoint elders. There's quite a bit of authority here. In verse one, or chapter 1, verse 9, he is to stand and fight for truth and godliness. He's saying, you have to preach these things and teach these things, and all those who you appoint, they, this is serious business. These aren't suggestions. Look at the next part here, in chapter 2, verse 15. True godly leaders have true godly authority. And that the, both of those are based in godliness. And we, so we, we have seen not only in this letter, but also in several other letters of the New Testament, the warnings against ungodly leaders. And so the, the Apostle Paul is saying to Titus, you have to insist on these things. And you're doing so not in your authority or even in my authority. You're doing this in God's authority. And a church has to understand this. Look at the next again statement. Again, we see, fill it in, the non-negotiable nature of God's instructions for inside and outside the church. In the inside chapter 2, outside in chapter 3, and we'll see that again in just a second. But notice here with me, these, this is the non-negotiable nature of God's plan for us as his people. You see, these are not, fill it in, I've said it before, these are not suggestions. When God is telling Christians how to behave toward other Christians, these are not suggestions. These are instructions. These are not best practices. These aren't tips for life. And, and, you know, we live in a culture when nobody wants to be authoritative when it comes to things of the matter of God. We just want to suggest things. We just want to give best practices. We very often want to teach how-to ideas so you can be a better you. You can live your best life now. You can be, you know, win friends and influence people and and all of that. And, And I'm not opposed to being positive. And, you know, my dad, he loves... um you know, various positive things that, that have been very encouraging to me over the years, Zig Ziglar and all of the others. Those are great things. But we can't impress the Zig Ziglar positive Tony Robbins mentality upon the church. When we impress motivational, positive thinking ideas upon the church, we lose many, many important commands that God has given us. 
You see, Christians are called not to do some things, and they're called to do some things, and it's not a suggestion. It is very clearly instructions from the creator of life. And so, if you haven't already filled it in, they are instructions for true believers. If you would, flip your page as we blast forward here a little bit. I've put some stars on the page on the back side, and because, and I haven't normally done that, that's kind of new, some of you have never seen that before, but this is kind of like ding, 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 you need to pay attention to this statement because this is huge. This is huge to us. First of all, read with me again verse 8. I'll read it aloud. You read silently. This is the box on the page, our main passage. He's saying the, tr- the saying is trustworthy, and that's the lyrics from that statement about the gospel. The saying is trustworthy. And I want you to insist on, circle the words, these things. I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. Can you circle those two words? And then look at the next words in the next sentence. These things, circle that again, are excellent and profitable for people. Now, he is talking about the instructions that he's given us. He's given specific instructions about how we are to be. And here is the big point that we need to see in Titus. That the gospel, fill this in, the gospel produces godliness in the lives of true believers. The gospel produces godliness. And put above the word godliness, like God. That we begin to act like God. You say, this guy thinks he's God? What are you talking about? When you, how do you act like God? Oh, when we begin to live near to God, we begin to follow God's commands, we begin to think the way God wants us to think and the way that God thinks, we become more and more like him in our values and in our behavior. You see, this is important for us to recognize, and this is right underneath that main statement. There is no legitimate separation between belief and behavior. There's no legitimate separation between someone's belief and their behaviors. Now, you say, why, why are you saying that? What do, what do you mean by that? Here, here's part of the problem. In cultural Christianity, it's okay to go to church, say that you believe that Christ is your Savior, and still just go off and live however you want to live, and nobody can say anything about it. You see, cultural Christianity just kind of says, well, it's each person with their own relationship with God. And, you know, who are you to say anything about that for me? Don't, you know, judge not lest you be judged. You ever heard that before? I mean, you know, it's your faith is your faith and my faith is my faith and ne'er the twain are, are really supposed to meet, especially if we disagree. But what we begin to see is, is that if we are truly Christians, then our lives should be truly Christian. We should begin to reflect the values of God. We should begin to reflect the nature of God, the character of God in the way that we think and what we do. And so that as people begin to look into our lives, they begin to see something different. In fact, they begin to see God in us. They begin to see his hand moving in us. They begin to see and begin to hear and begin to sense his presence with us so that we're living in such a way that our lives are showing the world what? Him. You see, when the world begins to look at Robert McElroy and the world begins to look at Indy Almeida and the world begins to look at, at each one of us that we see all across this room, I, I, I just see my beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, we want the world to begin to look into our lives and they, when they see Harriet Paulding, they, they begin to think of a woman who knows God and a woman who reflects God and a woman who can show them who God is in the midst of their pain, in the midst of their trouble, in the midst of their lives. And so there's, there, there's not to be a separation between what we say we believe and the life that we live. And that is a major problem amidst Christianity in this day and time. I will never forget that when I lived in North Africa, people would come to me and they would say, 
well, Paris Hilton is a Christian. I mean, Christians are a pretty big mess. I mean, Muslims would look at me and say, yeah, the Christian morality is pretty bad. And I say, what do you mean by that? And they would say, well, Paris Hilton is a Christian. And I would say, what makes you say Paris Hilton is a Christian? I hardly knew who Paris Hilton was. And they said, oh, well, I saw a really naughty video of her, and she had a cross around her neck. And so one of my questions was, well, why are you looking at the really naughty video? But, <laughs> so you're, you're apparently not doing too good either. But here she has a cross around her neck. And so they, they look at that and they go, oh, well, this must be the way Christians act. And we, we see and we hear all kinds of different reasons and all kinds of different things around our lives where, where Christians are sullying the name of Christ by the business deals that they make or by the morals that they keep or by the words that they speak or by the things that they buy, what they do with their money, how they train or do not train their children. And so the world, if they're looking at us and they're saying, well, this person is just like me and he claims to be a Christian, so, so you see, our lives are not to be confusing them about God. Our lives are to show them who God is by the way that we live. Look at verse 8 what it, where it says, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. You see, these things equal instructions for good works. That's what these things are. It's the good works that he's been talking about throughout the letter. It's based upon gospel transformation. That's what chapter 2 shows us, and that's what chapter 3 shows us, that if you're truly a Christian, if he's truly transformed you, then your behavior is going to show it. You see in chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, do you see what I have after that? Believer's behavior toward those inside the church. And you remember with me that we looked at four different Sundays Older men, older women, younger women, younger men, slaves, and leaders. Instructions were given how you're supposed to act in the church toward one another. And, and very powerful statements in, that are there, um, all, all about how we're supposed to act. Look at the, chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. You see, this is the believer's behavior toward the outside toward outside the church. And this is where we looked at the idea of being submissive to rulers and authorities, the general public, in fact, to all people, that we are to live with a godly way, both inside the church and outside the church. These things are the good works of doing that. So what are the good works in, in this? I, I just want to put out there that it's this. And the good works equal right living. Right living according to God's design and his instruction. And this letter is just replete with this. Verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1, it says, The knowledge of the truth that what? Circle the word accords. And right out there to the side, goes with. You see, we have truth that goes with a godly lifestyle that goes with godly behavior. Look at chapter 2 and verse 1. Same thing. Teach what goes with or what accords with what? Godliness. So the doctrine and the behavior are to line up together. There shouldn't be a confusing, nebulous cloud between the two that nobody can understand. Look at chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, and it says right there on the outline, it says, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. And here it is, verse 12, this is the right living. Training us to do what? Renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. You see, that's what Christians are supposed to do. Verse 13, and what are we doing? We're waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who, here it is, the substitution, verse 14, who gave himself for us to do what? To redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. And who are, what are they zealous for? 
They're zealous for doing the right thing, for living a godly life. They're zealous for good works. So throughout human history, God has graciously told us what to do, fill that in, what to do, and what not to do. Just think about the Ten Commandments with me. You are supposed to do this. You aren't supposed to do that. Thou shalt not take the Lord thy God's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. There's one that says don't do something. There's one that says do something. You see, to the degree, and this is, I want you to see this, to the degree that we obey him, we are blessed. Genesis 1 and 2, he gives us commands and he says, the earth is yours. Go, be fruitful, multiply, subdue it. The picture is his blessing poured out upon us. But to the degree that we disobey, we are cursed. In comes the picture of sin. Genesis chapter 3, right underneath Genesis chapter 3, the fall. Here we see the fall and the curse. This is where we disobey God. This is where we're not like God. This is where we walk away from God. This is where all of humanity falls into the horrific vortex of sin and all of its consequences. This is where earthquakes and car wrecks and cancer and all of the pain and all of the struggle and all of the hardship of life comes in as the creation says no thanks to God and is corrupted by walking away from God's beautiful picture. In Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of your sin or the payment of your sin is actually death. In Isaiah 59 and verse two it says, for your sins have cut you off from God. You see, this is the reason that we so desperately need a savior. And how do we come to obey God? Notice this with me, for condemned sinners obedience, fill it in, begins, I think it's already, already filled in, but I want you to see this, obedience begins with turning to God in repentance and belief. This is where good works begin. The first good work that anyone needs to have is not just starting to go to church, do better, not just starting to tithe a little bit more, not starting to do it. The first good work that should be most on our mind is repentance from our sin and belief in the Savior. That's the first great, that's where everything begins. When we begin to see our great need, and we begin to see our need to turn away from ourselves. And and for anyone who wonders about that, look carefully at Mark chapter 1 and verse 14. This is the beginning of Mark's gospel and the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. Jesus went into Galilee, and here's the very first thing that we see Jesus proclaiming. Jesus proclaimed the gospel of God, and here's what he said. The time is fulfilled, he said, and the kingdom of God is near, underline it, repent and believe the gospel. This is turn away from your sin and yourself and all that this world has to offer and turn to God in belief as your only hope. You see, the gospel is God's good news of eternal life for all those who turn to him and believe. And so the first good work that any body could ever hope for that condemned sinners need is repentance and belief. And the Holy Spirit comes and draws us to that. If God is calling you to believe in him today, I want to encourage you not to wait another moment to say, Lord, I repent of all that I've done against you. Lord, I repent of my sin. I repent of myself. I want to turn away from that. I want to turn back to you because I believe that you indeed are my only hope. I indeed believe that you died on a cross for my sins. You see, that is the beginning, and it's my prayer for you even right now, that some of you have been coming. Maybe you've heard this gospel for the first time in these last few weeks or whatever it may be. I want to encourage you to turn to God in belief during this service. I want to encourage you to say no to living in your sin and say yes to believing in him as the Savior. You see, notice this next statement is here. For saved sinners, obedience continues. So it begins with repentance and faith, but it continues by staying with Christ and bearing fruit. You see, the second one is the proof of the first one. 
If people stay with Christ and bear fruit, spiritual fruit in their life, this is the picture that they really have come to faith in Jesus. Look at John chapter 8 and verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Now, the word abide, right below the word rabbi, abide, remain. If you remain in my word, if you stay in my word, you are truly my disciples. You see, there's, Jesus would say this because there's many who kind of come and then they go. We talked about that during starting point this morning just a few minutes ago. I said one of the great burdens of my heart is all the people who come into Sheridan Hills and they come for a little while and then they go. And why is it that they go? Why is it that they go away from the gospel? Why is it that they perhaps go away from the church? And, and we talk about that in starting point. How do you come and stay? How do you come and stay, not just with Sheridan Hills, but far more importantly, how do you come and stay with the Lord? I, I know many people who have come, they seem to have made a spiritual decision, they seem to have heard the gospel and, and come to God, and then I go, and however it goes, I track them down, maybe years later, in fact, even decades later, I go and I meet them, and there is no indication of faith in their life. In fact, sometimes they are hostile toward God. And I go, wow, what happened back there? I mean, I remember the night, you know, I remember, I remember the time, I remember the service, I remember our Bible studies, I remember our prayer times, I remember your changed life. What happened? I just want to say to you that God has called us to remain with him, and Jesus is saying, proof that you really are my disciples is that you stay with me. If you don't stay with me, you're not mine. Cultural Christianity doesn't quite get that. Biblical Christianity says, wow, the proof is in the future. The proof of my salvation is what I do next and next and next and next. And so we see this beautiful picture that God is calling us to come and to stay with him and to remain with him. In fact, this table that we are about to observe can help you remain with the Lord. This table can help you turn away from the sins for which Jesus died and turn again back to the Savior who died for all of your sin. This table can help you remain with the Lord. It can remind you of the price that was paid in love for you so that you grow to love him more than you love your sin. That's the great goal. Take the biggest vice you have, a grudge, a habit, something that you can't get free from. God calls us to love him more than we love our fear of that issue or our indulgence in that issue. When we come to love him supremely above all other things, this is where victory over sin comes. This is where things start to work correctly. Notice John chapter 15. All verses 1 through 11 are important, but look at verse 8. Just look at verse 8. This is what I've included. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. Ooh, look what comes next. And so what? And so prove to be my disciples. You see, this is on the mind of Jesus, that we prove to be his disciples. You see, it has to do with what comes out of our mouth. It has to do with what we do with our hands. It has to do with how we live our life, that we bear fruit, that we remain with him, and so prove to be his disciples. We're not doing these things in order to be saved. We are doing these things because what? Very good, thank you. I can rest, I can take a good nap this afternoon. <sighs> we, some of you are going, what just happened? Well, here's what just happened. We say here in our church, we do the good works, we do the right things, not because we are hoping that they will save us. We, it's not be, we don't do these things because we want to be saved. We do these things because we are saved. You see, this is, this is the proof that I'm a Christian. 
Did I come and I worship with God's people? Did I seek to spend time with God? Did I seek to reflect God to a world? Did I seek to live a different life? That I don't just do the morals and I don't just do all the entertainment and all of the things and that, that indulge my flesh, but I seek to indulge the Savior. Amen. And so that one day, I'm ready for Him. So, finally, as we close... You see, the gospel of God's grace, the gospel of God's grace, and the good works that Titus is talking about, they are, here's the picture, all of this is beautiful. The gospel of God's, work, God's grace and the good works that go with it are beautiful. And that's what this verse says. Look at the end of verse 8. Look at the end of verse 8, and I put it right underneath that statement. Verse 8 at the end says these. These things are excellent, and they're profitable. The, the word excellent, the first definition, the primary definition of the word excellent is beautiful. And it's not beautiful in physical appearance. It's beautiful in value. It's like, oh, that's good. You know, it's like the storyline that comes along and something happens with the storyline and you're like, whoa, I didn't see that coming. That is good storytelling. I mean, that's, that's good. You, you know, it's not, it's, it's the idea that there, here's this beautiful thing that God does. And, he, and, and that's what he is saying to this. These things, that is both the gospel of God's grace and our good works together, these are excellent. These are beautiful. You see, they are good. And that's where we get the sermon title, is that God's plan is good. Notice this with me. Fill it in. Excellent means beautiful. It means good. It means worthy. And not only does the word excellent show up in verse 8, but the word profitable shows up in verse 8. And that means beneficial, useful. Look at this. Advantageous. You get the advantage when you live the way God calls you to live. And not advantage over taking away from somebody else, but advantage in that which is good for you by God's grace. You see, this is profitable for believers because God's plan for their life is best. This is profitable for those who know Christ because this is the better way. This is the best way. But also notice here, but it, it, it says for people, and it means all people, because it is profitable for unbelievers because some see faith in action that's in our lives, and they come to believe. So this is profitable for people. This is why Christians need to act like Christians, so that their neighbors, and so their co-workers, so their family members can say, wow, you're not just being odd for God and you're not being self-righteous and you're not being condemning. You are being something that I don't have a category for. And they come to discover that you are being godly. See, that's the picture. This is advantage. This is profitable for everyone. One, because it's good for the believer, but two, it brings the unbeliever to faith in Jesus. So, we've looked at this little verse and we've looked at this and seen that God has a plan for us to live lives of being grounded in his grace and being grounded in good works. Now here's my question. First question is this. Have you acted as if God's plan for your life is negotiable? Maybe you would say, well, I've had a deal with God. Me and God, we have a deal. You know, I go to church, but that means I get to do this over here. Or, you know, I, I gave my kids to the Lord, and so I live, you know, you, you know we, whatever it is, very often we, we seek in our minds to make deals with God. And what this passage is telling us, no, you insist on this stuff, Titus, because this is the gospel. We don't make deals with God. We come in submission to God's statement and his commands. 
You see, if you've made deals with God, I guess one of my questions is, where has that gotten you? Has God gotten you peace? Very likely not. Look at the next one here. Have you acted as if, as if God's plan is second best? Oh, yeah, I know I should do that, but that's really boring, or that's really not very good. Be careful about packing up. Wait just a minute. Think about the question. No, seriously, think. I want you to think about this. Christians sometimes struggle with looking at the world and thinking that God's plan is second best. There is so much tragedy in that. Because by faith, if we look that God's plan is, is first and best, we get to experience his joy and his grace in all of these things. May God lead us as we come to his table to remember what he has done for us. Let's pray.